You know, there are two types of people that uh, trust in Christ. There are those who trust in Christ, however, they seek their uh, daily dose of help and wisdom and provision elsewhere. And then there are those people that trust in Christ alone. And they believe that He, on a daily basis, is able to give us the, the help and the wisdom and the provision that we need for life. Almost 2,000 years ago, when the Apostle Paul wrote the letter that we call Colossians, it was his strong belief that Christ is sufficient for our every need. And that's my belief today as well. You see, I believe that when we align ourselves with the expression of God's will as revealed in His Word, then there will be nothing that we lack. And so in the first chapter of Colossians, the Apostle Paul is building a case for the sufficiency of Christ. And he's hoping that God's people will quit trying to draw spiritual water from dry wells, especially the dry wells known as man-made religions and secret societies that deceive God's people. And so I want to ask you that question today. Have you been deceived? And it may be, you think, an impossible question to answer because if you've been deceived, you wouldn't know it, would you, right? (laughs) So how would I know if I've been deceived? Now, I think it's a great question. I think it comes down to some basic math. There's There's a number of little principles that I believe in, little sayings that I've heard along the way, things such as nothing good ever happens after midnight. Uh, things such as uh, can't never did nothing. And another saying I believe in is math don't lie. And, uh, I mean, just do the math. You know, I know people who uh, they are upset about gas prices, and so they decide that they're going to get an extra 10 miles per hour per gallon by buying a new $50,000 car. <laughs> do the math on that thing before you make those kinds of decisions because math don't lie. And I think it comes down to some basic math to determine whether you've been deceived or not. You see, uh, the first thing I'd ask you is whether you've been influenced to add to your life authoritative sources other than the Bible. Think about that. Have you been influenced to add to your life sources of authority other than the Bible? And if so, you may have been deceived because you hear things like, well, you know, the Bible is good, but... The way you interpret the Bible is by reading an additional revelation from God. Or you'll hear things like, well, you know, over the years the Bible's been corrupted. And what you need is to read our translation of the Bible that's been left uncorrupted. Or people will say things like, oh, you know, the Bible's good because, uh, you know, it's one of many holy books from God, just like the Koran for Muslims or like the Vedas for Hindus. There's no difference between them, they say. Or they'll be a little bit more subtle, and they will place the Bible at the front of their meetings next to other symbols on a table, symbolically diminishing the uniqueness and the authority of the Word of God. See, sometimes the deceiver influences you to add to your life sources of authority intended to give you wisdom and help and provision that are other than the Bible. But it might not just be the things that you add that deceives you. It might be some things that you subtract. Have you ever been influenced to subtract from the person and work? Of Jesus Christ. You'll hear things like this. You'll, you'll hear things that people say things like, Well, God has revealed himself through Jesus and through this other prophet in latter days. Or you'll hear things like, Well, Jesus is the greatest of all the persons that God created. We learned last week. That Jesus is the creator, not the created. Or they say things like, well, Jesus is one of many prophets that God uses to speak 
to humanity. You see, sometimes the deceiver will try to get you to subtract from the person and work of Christ Jesus. But then again, it may not be what you add or subtract. It may be what you multiply. Have you been influenced to multiply the requirements for salvation? You hear things like this. Well, to go to heaven, you need to trust in Jesus and do the good works that we tell you to do. Or they'll say things like, well, you know, to, to be saved, to really be on the right side of God, then what you need to do is join our society and be a member in good standing. Do the good things we tell you to do, which of course includes paying your dues. Sometimes the deceiver influences you to multiply the requirements for salvation. But then again, it may not be what you add or subtract or multiply. It might be what you divide. Have you been influenced to divide your loyalty from Christ by focusing on a different religious figure or organization? And this is the most subtle deception of all. It's the deception of distraction. You see, the more the deceiver can take your eyes off of Christ, the less committed to Christ you'll be, the less effective for Christ you will be. You'll hear things like, well, we recognize that Jesus inspires a lot of people, but it doesn't matter what supreme being you believe in, just as long as you believe in a supreme being. Or they say, there are many paths to God. Jesus is one of them. Or they say, you know, hey, our organization does a lot of good in the community. You ought to be a part of it. But they don't tell you that some of their secret ceremonies are steeped in occultism. Listen, when you add authoritative sources to your life other than the Bible... When you subtract from the person and work of Jesus Christ, when you multiply requirements beyond faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone in order to be saved, or when you divide your loyalty from Christ, you undoubtedly will be deceived. The truth is that you need Christ and Christ alone. He is sufficient for your salvation, and He is sufficient for your daily needs of help, wisdom, and provision. So the question is, why? Why is Christ sufficient in all of these things for me? Well, last week, as we studied Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 17, we discovered a number of reasons why Christ is sufficient for you. If you are a follower of Christ, we discovered that you follow the revealer of the invisible God. You follow the supreme ruler over all creation. You follow the creator of all physical and spiritual things. You follow the creative agent that God the Father used to create all things. You follow the recipient of of all created things. You follow the eternal and pre-existent one, and you follow the sustainer of all things. And if that's not enough, the Apostle Paul continues in, this, in the passage that we'll study today, verses 18 through 20 of Colossians chapter 1. I invite you to turn in your Bible to that passage if you have a Bible available to you. Colossians chapter 1. Verses 18 through 20, Paul gives us even more reasons why Christ alone is sufficient for us. And I would ask, if you found the place, would you stand with me, please, in honor of the reading of God's Word. In Colossians chapter 1, three short verses, verses 18 through 20, this is what we read. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead 
so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on, on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Heavenly Father, I pray that you grant us wisdom and insight to understand these things and to apply them to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In this passage, in verse 18, we read, He is also the head of the body, the church. I want to talk about what it means for Christ to be the head of the body. And specifically for you, what it means is this. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you follow the head of the church. Being the head of the church is more than being the pastor of a local church. It's more than simply being the shepherd of a local church. Jesus has a higher uh, stake in things than that. Being the head of the church is greater than being the president of a denomination of churches. Being the head of the church is greater than being even the CEO of all churches in existence. Because here's the idea. Before God created anything, He decided to make a family. He decided to make some beings who would belong to Him. And so God created all things. He created spiritual beings. He created physical beings. And these beings were, like Him, free to do as they wished. He gave them free will. And God intended for these beings to use their freedom, to use their free will, to freely love one another and to love Him. That's how we are to use our freedom. However, things didn't turn out that way, did they? Through Adam, humanity freely chose to disobey God. And this act of rebellion created a kingdom, a spiritual sphere, a realm, if you will, of sickness and sin and death. And this is the kingdom that you and I are born into. This is the reason that sometimes, tragically, even innocent babies die. They're born into a realm of sickness and sin and death. And so are we. And this is the realm that we belong to. But that kingdom, that kingdom of darkness, we'll call it, that kingdom did not stop God's plans to have a family that freely chose to love Him and belong to Him. God's kingdom was still alive. God's kingdom was still active, and God's Son brought it to us. And so whoever would follow the Son, whoever would receive the Son, would receive the Father. And there's only one way to receive the Son, and that is by faith. You must believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and you must believe that through his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead, Jesus has established the restoration of all things. Things that have been disturbed by evil and sin. A part of this redemptive and restorative act by Christ Jesus includes the creation of a people that belong to God. This was God's intention from the very beginning. To have a people all of his own who would freely choose to love him. And that is the church. That is who we are. If you are a believer in Christ Jesus, then you are a member, a part of this special group of people. You are a member of the body of Christ and Christ is the head of this 
church. Christ being the head of the church means that Christ is the authority over the church. And this has some implications. Implication number one. Christ is the head of the whole church. We're talking about every Christian and every local church that has ever existed. And I think we need a proper understanding of how local churches, such as the one that we belong to, interact with and are related to the church universal, the church with a capital C, if you will. The church with the capital C, the church universal, is not simply the totality of all of the local churches, but rather each local congregation, however small, represents the total community of God. Each local congregation represents the church universal. Here at this church, we should not think of ourselves as an independent, isolated, broadview church that sometimes happens to stand side by side with other churches. It is more precise to think of us as the church that happens to be at Broadview. Each local congregation represents the totality of the church universal. And so here in Lubbock, there is the church at Broadview. There is the church at Redbud, where my friend Carlos is pastor. There is the church at Indiana Avenue, where my friend Steve McMeans is pastor. You see, the local church is not simply one part of the universal church, but rather the local church is the church in its local expression. And you might say, well, what difference does it make? Isn't that just semantics? You know, what, what difference does it make if we're simply part of the universal church or whether we are the whole church in a local expression? Here's the difference. You have a car, most likely, right? Your car is made up of a lot of different parts, Right? But your tires are not responsible for giving you cold air when you turn the AC on. Your exhaust pipe does not clean your windshield when you turn the wipers on. At least I hope not. It's not working right. You see, your car is made up of a lot of different parts that are limited to a specific function. That is not what we have in the local church. Every local church can do all things in Christ. The whole power of Christ is available to every local congregation. All of Christ's authority is present and active in every local church. Each local congregation functions in its community just as the universal church functions in the world as a whole. And this means that each local congregation is not an isolated group, but it stands in solidarity with the church with the capital C as a whole. You see, when Christians in Ukraine, are suffering and dying. These are not strangers to us, even though we may not know their name. They are our brothers. They are our sisters. When pastors in Canada are arrested and imprisoned for simply obeying God, these are not nameless individuals. They are faithful shepherds of God's flock. The connection that we have with the church and other locales means that Redbud Baptist Church is not 
our competition. They are our partners in ministry. The same is true of any and all churches that lift up the name of Christ and are true to the faith. Please understand that we are the church that happens to be at Broadview. Second implication. Since Christ is the head of the church, it means that none of us are. We need to understand this very clearly. I have pastored churches where a certain individual or a certain control group, a power group, thought it was their plaything. It is not. Broadview Church is not to be run by me. Broadview Church is not to be run by you. Broadview Church is not even to be run by the entire gathered congregation. It is to be run by Christ. The local church is not here so you can wield control and power over something that you consider to be your religious social club. The pastors here are to be under shepherds of the great shepherd. The deacons here are to be servants of the suffering servant. The other leaders here are to be ministers of the Savior who loves us. The congregation as a whole here is to be a group of followers of what John the Baptist said, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Follow Him. That is who we are. Christ is our head. All of us are to obey Him. He is the head of the church. And so when we have a decision among us or that before us, we are to seek His will as revealed in His Word and th- given to us through the power of His Holy Spirit. Implication number three. Since Christ is the head of the church, and if the church is following his will, I submit to you that it would be an unwise choice to oppose his church. To oppose a church that is following the will of Christ means that you are opposing Christ himself. And you can read in Acts chapter 5 about Ananias and Sapphira that that can be a dangerous thing to do. Christ is the head of the church. His authority over it is not conditional upon you or me, nor is he seeking our approval to be the head. He already is the head, and he will remain the head. Anyone who crosses him or thinks they can take headship from him have, will soon learn they're running into an authority greater than themselves. Verse 18 continues. It says that he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. This means that Christ takes precedence over all of creation, and not only over all of creation, but Christ takes precedence over all things that will be recreated. You see, in the future, Christ Jesus will recreate everything we know, and He will make a new heaven. He will make a new earth. Not only will Jesus resurrect all people in order to stand before Him at the judgment, And not only will those of us who believe in him continue to live with him forever in our resurrected glorified bodies, but Christ will also redeem and recreate all things. Our Savior has defeated death. Our Savior is not dead. Our Savior is very much alive. He has been resurrected from the dead And he will never, ever die again. 
And because Christ Jesus has been resurrected, so shall we be resurrected. And because he's been resurrected, all of creation itself will be redeemed. You see, when Jesus died on that cross, not only did he take away your sins and the sins of the world, Jesus did much more than that. Jesus, through the cross, will undo every effect of Adam on this world. Every sickness, every disease will be eliminated. Every injustice will be made right. Every polluted thing will be made pure. All of creation will be redeemed and restored. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, verse 19 says. What does that mean? All of the fullness of God dwells in him. Colossians 2, verse 9, the very next chapter, Paul says something very similar. He says, for the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. You might wonder, okay, what difference does that make to me? Pay close attention. If the fullness of God dwells in the body of the resurrected and exalted Christ, that means that there is no other way to get in touch with God. It is only through Christ that you can come to know God. Let's suppose that you were on a spiritual quest to find God. You made it your life's aim to go on a spiritual quest to find God. You wouldn't be the first person to do so. Many people throughout history have tried. And let's suppose in your spiritual quest to find God, you, you came across a holy angel. Or let's suppose you came across some other spiritual being that was to other people invisible. But you had this encounter. Or let's suppose that you went to the highest mountain and spoke to the most isolated, holy guru, a wise man. Or let's suppose that you traveled all the way to Italy, and you made your way to Rome, and you made your way into the Vatican City, and all the way into St. Peter's Basilica. Or let's suppose that in your quest to find God, you had a group of friends who said, come be a part of our secret society. Any and all of those experiences would be insufficient. Union with God must come through Christ Jesus or not at all. Why? Because God has chosen for all of his fullness to dwell where? In Him, and Him alone. And it is Christ who has all of the fullness of God within Himself who will reconcile all things to the Father, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Now how? How will Christ do all of this? How will Christ reconcile all things to the Father? Verse 20 tells us at the very end, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. There is so much here in this last phrase, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. We could spend countless Sundays on this phrase alone, but I'm going to point out two things to you. Number one, You can have peace with God. You can have peace within yourself. It is possible. This room is filled with people who have experienced God's peace. You can have peace with God. How does it come? Through Christ. Peace with God comes through Christ. 
If you know Christ, and by know I mean K-N-O-W, if you know Christ in a personal way, then you will know peace. But if you will have no part of Christ, then you will have no peace. Peace in life comes through Christ. The second thing that I would have you notice, and it's this last part of verse 20, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. There's an implication here, and it's almost stated quite openly. The implication is this. God requires a blood sacrifice. Now, we don't think about blood sacrifices very often. I mean, you, you might say, well, isn't that something that, you know, primitive, isolated, tribal people sort of do? They engage in blood sacrifices. I mean, aren't we more sophisticated than that today? Uh, aren't blood sacrifices, oh, I don't know, Pastor, aren't they illegal? You know, we can't engage in blood sacrifices, right? But listen, it's not about being unsophisticated, or it's not about being gross, or it's not about any other type of condition or experience that you, or, you and I might engage in. It's what God requires. God requires a blood sacrifice. It's that simple. You see, with all of the sins that you've committed, do you simply think that saying, sorry about that, will atone for your sins? I don't think so. I mean, even we have higher standards of justice than that, and we're unjust people. For example, if someone gets drunk and gets behind the wheel and ends up killing a family of five, do you think if that person simply apologizes, that's good enough? I don't think so. That would be an injustice, right? To simply let someone like that off scot-free by simply giving a verbal apology means that we don't value the family whose lives were lost, right? Right? Or let's make it something a little bit less macabre. Let's say it's uh, a child that acts up in class. Something none of us have ever experienced, right? But this child constantly acts up in class. Every single day. How long should it go without consequences coming down on that child? Failure to have consequences on that child diminishes the authority of the teacher, right? Of course. So let's take you and God. Let's suppose that in your life, oh, you were able to keep your sin count down to only three a day. Wouldn't that be good? Just three bad actions a day or... Three wrong things you say each day, you know, three gossips or three slanders or three dirty words or three angry voices, you know, that type. Just three. Or included are thoughts in the count. Just three bad thoughts. You know those dirty words you think but you don't say? Yeah. Just three of those. Three of, three of those angry thoughts you have. Let's just say... Three a day. You only committed three sins a day. And let's start the clock at age 10. And let's say you live to a ripe old age of 80. 70 years, right? Well, three sins a day times 365 days, that's over 1,000 sins in a year. Times 70 years, that's 70,000 thousand spiritual crimes that you've committed against God. Now, let's suppose that you got a traffic ticket and you went before the judge and the judge looked at your uh, record and this is your 70,000th traffic ticket. 
And your response to the judge was, sorry about that. It's just my nature. I don't think you're getting off scot-free with the sorry, are you? And that's before a judge who himself is unrighteous. When you and I come before the holy and righteous and perfect and pure and wrathful God of the universe, the judge of all things, with 70,000 spiritual crimes against him, sorry ain't gonna cut it. It just won't. And this judge is not like an earthly judge. His standards are perfect. You see, your sins, just yours alone, much less the sins of the whole world, require a blood sacrifice. That's how offensive your sins are against God. Your sins require the penalty of death. But there's good news. The good news is that this holy and righteous and perfectly pure judge also loves you. And he has provided a substitute. Someone else to pay the blood sacrifice. The substitute is none other than his son, Christ Jesus. Christ is the one who made peace through his blood shed on the cross. Christ is the only way to God. No one else has or will pay the penalty for your many sins. So today the offer is clear. If you want to receive Christ, if you want to be in Christ Jesus, You need to understand who He is. He's Lord over all. You need to understand what He did. He died on a cross to pay for your sins, and He rose from the dead to give you eternal life and make you right before God. And all you have to do is trust in Him and confess Him as Lord. And all of the forgiveness, the peace, The righteousness, the love of God will be yours. This is God's offer for you today.